Coming up, the story of an unlikely friendship. I was always waiting for the shoe to fall, and then one day she asked me to be friends with a crazy homeless man who threatened to kill everybody. We'll talk with the stars behind the new film, Same Kind of Different as Me. It does make you ask yourself, okay, what am I doing? <laughs> Plus, a guide to a love that lasts. We're infected with this disease of fake love, and it's killing us. Jefferson and Elizabeth Key joins us live on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, it looks like the Republicans in the Senate have finally got their act together, at least for now. They passed a spending bill which was an important thing, but it paved the way for tax reform. And the American people are saying, can you deliver? And the president is saying to the Republicans, you better deliver. We've got to have middle class tax cuts. We've got to have business tax cuts because American corporations are now paying some of the highest taxes in the world. And Republicans say that with this bill, they can make the economy stronger and put more money into people's wallets sometime in the thousands of dollars. It is a major, major uh, breakthrough, mm -hmm. and they got it through the usual 5149, That's but they right. got it through. They got it through. That was the stage that was set last night to make a difference for uh, all of this. The Senate had to pass the budget that Pat was talking about for the debate on the tax code to go forward. And as Jenna Browder reports from Washington, they got the job done. So let's see what's gonna happen, Jenna. The stage is set for a tax reform bill after the Senate pushed through a $4 trillion budget last night. Republicans want to completely overhaul the U.S. tax code, including cutting rates for individuals and corporations, and at the same time eliminating trillions of dollars of deductions and special interest tax breaks. The president and I believe that the tax code's too complicated. Maybe some of you agree. <laughs> Vice President Mike Pence touting tax reform in New York. The truth is that the American people spend millions of hours and billions of dollars filling out our taxes every year. And I'm anxious to hear if people around this table have that feeling as well. Under the president's plan, 90 percent of the American people will be able to file their taxes on one piece of paper without professional help. But divisions within the GOP could hold up the process. Appearing on CBN's online political show, Faith Nation, Senator Marco Rubio stressed the importance of getting something done. How concerned are you that the GOP could lose the majority in the midterms? I think if we don't do what we said we were going to do, people have a right to ask themselves, well, why do we need you there? And it's frustrating as someone who has supported all these things to see one or two people standing in the way of us actually doing. Hopefully that'll change with tax reform. Democrats blasted the GOP budget, okay. saying it will shower benefits on top bracket earners, corporations, business partnerships, and people inheriting multi-million dollar estates. But I think it is terribly important, and I really do appeal to the media, uh, to allow for a serious discussion on what I consider to be the cruelest and most unfair budget uh, presented uh, by the majority party uh, in the modern history of this country. We beat the Trump health care scam twice, and we're going to beat him a third time on his tax scam. President Trump promises the tax plan, which is still being finalized, is aimed at helping the middle class. The and frankly, I think we have the votes for the tax cuts, which will follow fairly shortly thereafter. All told, Senate Republicans would cut spending by more than $5 trillion over a decade, though it's unclear where the cuts would come from. It's a heavy lift to pass tax reform by the end of the year. But if Congress can do it, this will be the first bill of its kind passed since 1986 when President Reagan was in office. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, it's long overdue. Now, here's, uh, can you imagine it's so cruel for him to say it's cruel? It's $5 trillion worth of spending. It's cruel. I mean, this is ridiculous. They, they've uh, doubled the uh, uh, well, the, 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 you, you have in your taxes, you can either take an itemized deduction or you can take the uh, standard deduction, and they've raised the standard deduction, which will affect most uh, of the filers. To say that's cruel is ridiculous because it's going to put $1,000, $2,000 into people's pockets. The thing about it is the only people who pay taxes 
uh, are, are the ones who will get uh, some benefit. And if you're not paying any taxes now, what difference does it make? A lot of people are not paying any taxes at all. So this is going to give some relief to those who do pay taxes. And I think it's important to recognize that. But this rhetoric coming out of the Democrats is nonsense. Cruel budget, come off it. Uh, it's nothing cruel about it. It's just a question of how much money can we uh, afford to you know, spend. But this is going to make a major uh, shift in certain of these deductions. They, they, they want to take away the mortgage interest on big, uh, expensive property. They want to take away the deductions for uh, the income taxes of, of the states, which is a big deal. And uh, if they take those deductions away, uh, they won't have as much uh, uh, play in this uh, uh, bill as uh, it sounds like, because they'll, they'll have enough money to pay for a lot of these cuts. And it's important to do it. it, it but it, it seemed like to me they, they, might, they ought to get the t cuts in first. Because if they wait to reform the whole tax code, it is a monstrosity. It's got more pages in the Bible, for heaven's sakes. And to go through that item by item will be a nightmare. So they need to get some of these major cuts in, cuts in personal rights, the, the, the cuts in, in um, the corporate right particularly, and uh, get that out of the way. And there's certain things like... Um, for example, the death tax, they could do away with that. Uh, there are other things that are easy to do. Uh, maybe it's not easy to get it through, but the, the, it doesn't take a lot, a lot of uh, technical work. And then they can get to the nitty gritty of reforming the tax code. But anyhow, it's a major, major vote uh, in the Senate, and it bodes well for the passage of the tax uh, reform. Well, in other news, we're going to be getting our first look and another one of President Trump's top priorities, the wall. <laughs> the wall with Mexico. Ephraim Graham has that. Pat, just south of San Diego, we're getting an early glimpse at what that border wall might look like. Our national security correspondent, Eric Rosales, shows us prototypes of what could eventually run along the U.S.-Mexico border. Despite ongoing debate, work continues on a construction project to build a border wall in Ote Mesa, a community just outside of San Diego. Six companies are vying for a major construction contract. The companies have just 30 days to build a total of eight prototypes. Designs must also meet specific requirements. Anti-climbing, anti-digging, anti-scaling. They're going to have to be safe for the Border Patrol agents that work the area. Agent Eduardo Alamos wouldn't break down the company's tactics, but you can clearly see spikes on at least one model. Another includes a bit of a slant, and this one contains an anti-climbing texture. Four of them will be concrete, the other four will be other than concrete. The massive prototypes will be 30 feet high and 30 feet wide. The fact that each one is isolated gives them a towering appearance. The cost is between 300000 to 500000 each. Since the final design is yet to be chosen, exact estimates aren't available. A Homeland Security internal report estimates the wall could cost more than $21 billion, and that doesn't include the cost to maintain it. Maintenance of the current fencing runs around $55 million a year. Build a wall, build a wall, build a wall, build a wall. A centerpiece for the president's campaign to make America great again, the wall has sparked a lot of controversy. Still, the concept is nothing new. Olmo says before the wall was built along the sector near San Diego in the early 1990s, around 600,000 people were arrested in just one year. He says the current wall has made a difference, but it can be improved. Unfortunately, those actually just sit on the ground and uh, rudimentary tunnels can actually be dug underneath them very easily. Ironically, the prototype construction comes at a time when border crossings are down. According to the Office of Immigration Statistics, people attempting to illegally cross any state along the U.S. border are unsuccessful 55 to 85 percent of the time. Yet assaults on Border Patrol agents in the same sector number 83 this year. That's an increase over last year when 52 assaults occurred but nowhere near the peak in 2008 when agents recorded 377 assaults. How will the prototypes be tested? Homeland Security tells me that's a secret. The agency did tell CBN News the prototypes will be tested by teams on which ones are hardest to scale, dig under, and break through. And it will not be done in the public's eye. 
Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. White House Chief of Staff John Kelly delivered a strong defense Thursday of President Trump's phone call to the widow of Green Beret Le David Johnson. He was killed by ISIS terrorists in an ambush in Niger earlier this month. Florida Representative Frederica Wilson had criticized the president for his being insensitive when he called Thompson's widow. Kelly said he was stunned by Wilson's criticism. Kelly said President Trump wanted to make the calls to military families, and he defended the president's phone call. In his way, tried to express that opinion. He's a brave man, a fallen hero. He knew what he was getting himself into because he enlisted. There's no reason to enlist. He enlisted. And he was where he wanted to be, exactly where he wanted to be, with exactly the people he wanted to be with when his life was taken. That was the message. That was the message that was transmitted. Kelly called Representative Wilson a, quote, empty barrel who makes noise. A spokesperson for Wilson said the controversy should not be about her, but about remembering and honoring a fallen hero and fighting for his family. Pat. Kelly has become a national hero uh, through his uh, magnificent statement. You know, what he said is, I lost a son, and my uh, chief of staff came to me and said, how do you handle it? And what he said was, my son volunteered to do what he did. He knew what he was getting into, and he gave his life, and he's a hero. Now, that was the response of a general to a general. And so the general advised the president, that's what you say. And for this congresswoman to go off half-cocked and start attacking Kelly, who is himself a hero and a gold star father, who walked among the graves in Arlington and looked at the dead and fallen heroes, and who said a magnificent statement, but that's the truth. It, it isn't a, a nice, sweet thing. You say, oh, dear lady, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss, and I want to comfort you in your grief. What he was told by his uh, aide, another general, look, he volunteered for it. He's a hero. He wanted to do it. He wanted to go out and face the enemy. And he gave his life for this country. That is not necessarily a, a sugar-coated message, but it's a message that every parent should be proud of, that their child, if they were, were dying in the service of this country, that they, they embraced the opportunity to serve. And that's what he said. So I wish that congresswoman would get off her high horse. I mean, she has become a laughing stock, in my opinion. Ephraim? Pat, President Trump defended the U.S. response to the crisis in Puerto Rico after back-to-back -back hurricanes devastated the island, including a direct hit from Hurricane Maria, which knocked out power across the island and left areas without clean water. Asked to rate the U.S. effort on a scale of 1 to 10, the president gave the U.S. effort the highest marks. I'd say it was a 10. I'd say it was probably the most difficult um when you talk about relief, when you talk about search, when you talk about all of the different levels, uh, and even when you talk about lives saved, uh, you look at the number. I mean, this was, I think it was worse than Katrina. It was in many ways worse than anything people have ever seen. Operation Blessing is also in Puerto Rico providing vital emergency relief. Operation Blessing is helping to provide water to thousands of Puerto Ricans every day and about 300 families in the community of La Perla were some of the first to benefit. A water purification unit provided operation by Operation Blessing turned salt water into drinking water for that tiny community. Operation Blessing has also distributed more than 100,000 aqua tabs to disinfect the drinking water. This is only part of Operation Blessing's response to help disaster, disaster victims there, and teams are sending additional relief to the island even as we speak. Pat? Well, Bill Horan, I was talking to yesterday about what the response of Operation Blessing is down there. And he said, the mayor of San Juan loves us. Uh, she, she is, this is her favorite charity, what I, he was telling me. Uh, but here's the deal. We have sent in eight reverse osmosis water purification units. That means they're taking salt water to make it into uh, clean drinking water. 
got nine water uh, desalinization units in addition to the reverse osmosis. Um, we have more than 20 generators to run essential uh, equipment. And we've also got these interesting lights uh, that uh, they, they turn a switch and these things are all working off solar power. And I think that's their solar lanterns. And we're running uh, uh, five chlorine generators making 24-7 each year, producing 150 gallons of chlorine. And the chlorine is what you need to purify the water. So we've got a major water project with Operation Blessing. And uh, the mayor said, you know, we didn't call them. <laughs> Where'd they come from? Well, Operation Blessing meets the need. They learn where the need is and go to help it. Now, if you want to participate, it's one of the finest charities in the United States of America. It's on the ground and it's helping people. 1-800-700-7000. Uh, Operation Blessing or CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, disaster Relief Fund. It's a wonderful organization. I'm very proud of what's being done. And uh, Bill Horan and his team, David Darg, is down there working. And they get down there and live with the people, and they suffer with them. And they know how to make an intelligent response to their need. But they need clean water, and they're getting it through Operation Blessing. So isn't that exciting? It is wonderful. Yeah. We should mention also at the same time that they're in Puerto Rico, they're still in Florida, they're still in Texas. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, they are in multiple places and stay to get the job done. So I've, I've heard of some of the one other charity that I cannot name, but uh, they're charging uh, people, you know, for like a bologna sandwich. They're charging them seven or eight bucks for one of these things. And they charge the government for that. And they're getting a lot of money. But people keep saying, where is X? Mm -hmm. And X ain't there. But yeah. where is Operation Blessing? It's right here beside you. And it's going to be here for the duration until we help uh, people through. And so uh, we, we're carrying them through from Texas, carrying them through from uh, Florida, and now in Puerto Rico, and of course, Whatever happened in New Orleans was magnificent because I was down there with Operation Blessing. And the, 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 the way they can organize volunteers by the hundreds and hundreds of, of, of volunteers come into work, and Operation Blessing uh, immediately gives them something to do, gives them a project, organizes them, takes them to the site of where they can work. And, and these people are helping put roofs on homes and putting in drywall and taking mold out and doing all this uh, work of uh, de clearing out debris. And all these volunteers, all under the auspices of Operation Blessing. So you need to be completely proud of them. I'm proud of what they're doing. Terry. Well, still ahead, a young woman who ran to a safe house to flee her abusive boyfriend, only to find him on the doorstep. She sees fire is breathing from this man. I saw his fist clench up. I'm thinking he's about to kill this woman and then he's gonna kill me. Find out what stopped him. Plus, we've got your email questions. Daniela asks, would sin still exist if Eve didn't eat the apple? I'm mad at her. Another round of your questions with some honest answers. That's coming up next, don't go away. Well, it's time to answer some of the questions you've sent in with honest questions or yeah. honest answers, your okay. questions, honest answers. So, Pat, this first one comes from Daniela, who says, Pat, I often think about Eve and how upset I am with her that she ate from the tree, which God had commanded her not to. I feel that if she had not done this, there would be no sin in the world or suffering as there is today. What do you think would have happened if she did not eat of the fruit and actually obeyed God? How would things have changed? Didn't God know she'd be tempted and then fall? I just don't feel we should all care the burden for this one woman's sin. The condition of the world angers me and it all goes back to her. Well, uh, I tell you what, I, I know you feminists would like to make Eve the focal point, but the Bible <laughs> says it was Adam. When Adam did it, uh, he was the head of the human race and the federal head is the say in theological term. And we all came out of Adam. But Eve tempted Adam and then uh, 
And by the way, it wasn't an apple. It was not, you know, I, I, I'm from Virginia. <laughs> we have a lot of delicious apples. But uh, it wasn't an apple. It was the fruit of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. But, you know, if it hadn't been for Adam taking sin, and through Adam all sinned, and uh, through the knowledge of Jesus, all have been made righteous. So he came to cleanse the world of the curse that was descended on mankind because of Adam and Eve. And uh, the idea was, I mean, perhaps they're real. They probably were real people. But at the same time, it's certainly a good symbol. It's the symbol of man's depravity. Where did it come from? Man, you know, what is the, the tree of knowledge, by the way? You go by that tree and You'd say to yourself, if I don't eat that tree, I'm obeying God. It's a good thing. If I eat the tree, it's sin. And that's how you learn the knowledge of good and evil. You know, you don't have to participate in it. You just learn it. And that tree was a symbol. And so if I eat the fruit, it's, uh, you know, I'm sinning. If I don't eat the fruit, I'm not sinning. And so they learned the knowledge of good and evil. That's what it was about. And you, it's hard to say what paradise would have been. We wouldn't have had sin. We would have had death. The, the world would have been a most glorious place. People wouldn't be killing each other. There wouldn't be uh, this d disease plague we have. We wouldn't be facing the menace of nuclear holocaust and all this stuff. Uh, it would have been a good thing. But don't blame it on poor old Eve. I mean, Eve, <laughs> Eve. <laughs> tempted Adam, but Adam had to say yes to Eve. And, you know, men have the right to say no to their wives. <laughs> Keep that in mind. All right, what else okay. do we have? <laughs> this is Kayla who says, I've been struggling and praying to God about what I should do. I've been in a long-term relationship with a guy who wants to marry me. However, he's not a Christian. He was a Seventh-day Adventist before he decided that it was not for him anymore and that God had just forgotten about him. I was raised a Christian and I attend church regularly and sometimes my boyfriend attends with me. He never dissuades me from believing and following God. I love him very much and I feel like God put me in his life for a reason. My question to you is, would it be a sin to marry outside my religion? Wouldn't God want us to love everyone even if they might have doubts about him? Uh, you know, isn't it amazing? I'm in a long-term relationship. That means you're living with a guy and you're having sex together, but you're not married. That's what that... Well, couldn't it just mean that they've been going together for oh, a long time? Oh, come off it. Okay. Long-term relationship, you know... Excuse me. Yeah, you know good and well what it means. <laughs> well, maybe. In yeah. to, oh, today's world, of course it means they're living together. And, uh, the, you know, if they're living together, they're having sex together, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but, you know, all right, so is it going to be a sin to marry outside your religion? Well, he's a seventh day. Uh, he was. He's not even practicing. His well, he's not in anything. Before. Yeah. The, the Bible says, and this is very important, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship has Christ with the Belial? So if you're a Christian, it isn't appropriate to get married to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. But maybe that man will find the Lord. Maybe in your life and your testimony, you can lead him to the Lord. But you're not going to do it if you keep on doing what you're doing. You need to break and, and get yourself appropriately married. And then out of that marriage, build a life together. All right, real quick, one last. This is a viewer who says, my sister's grown up Christian, but has recently turned away from God. She believes that the Bible's been rewritten so many times that the Bible just doesn't make sense anymore. She read online that only a few thousand Christians will make it to heaven. She believes that when we die, we will become our own God. She also thinks that the government created religion to keep the world in order. She said that she's done her research and this is the aftermath of it. Can you please explain to her that this is false in the Christian religion? Well, it's totally false. You know, the Bible hasn't been rewritten. There are manuscripts. The, the Old Testament, for example, has been preserved carefully by the Jewish scribes, and it's called the Textus Receptus. And the Bible has not been rewritten many times. It was the original Greek. We, we go back, we've got a few manuscripts, and there are a few changes, but nothing of any great substance. The Old Testament, the Hebrew, 
has been there ever since it was written, period. And so she's wrong in that. In terms of, um, well, uh, all this other stuff about only a few thousand people, well, that, that was, um, who was it, the Jehovah's Witnesses thought 144,000 mm, will yeah. get saved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then when they got a whole lot more, they changed their doctrine. Uh, a lot of people will come to the Lord. There will be millions in heaven. The Bible, you know, says, I mean, the Lord spoke to me one time. He said, you know, heaven is very large, and your job is to bring people into heaven. That's what heaven is. God wants to save as many. It is the will of God that all should be saved, and, and that, that, that all, excuse me, many should be saved, and all should come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. So your, who's a daughter, friend, whatever, uh, is just confused. And whoever's been feeding this junk to her, it's, it's just not accurate. It's not correct. And it's, it's a shame that it would destroy somebody's life. Well, we've got a lot of things going on on this show today. For 10 years, Lakeisha Christian endured bruises, black eyes, and even a loaded gun to her head. She endured a cycle of abuse until she found someone willing to stand up for her. Watch this. Wanting to have hugs and wanting to have kisses and wanting to be tucked in bed at night and all those special things you do, you know, with your parents when you're a child. These are the things Lakeisha Christian missed most after her parents divorced and her father moved out when she was eight. I started really wanting those things and actually kind of uh, craving those things in a way. I was looking for someone to say, you're pretty. I was looking for someone to say, you're amazing. I was looking for those words that made me feel like I, I mattered. Lakeisha grew up and once a teenager, turned to boys and sex for the answer. It was fulfilling and satisfying me for a moment. And if I could just feel this all the time, I'll be okay. They love me. They love me. Um, and they want me. They need me. And I need them. So I became very needy, and I started to attach myself to them. It was a void within me where I would actually cry every single night. What is wrong with me? At 17, she got pregnant. She was scared, but kept the baby and moved in with the father. I thought, this means I'm finally going to be happy. I have a baby that loves me. I love this child. And me and the father will make this perfect life together. And I'll be fixed. Everything will be OK. The man became unstable, and Lakeisha left. Her next boyfriend soon became abusive and controlling. And it didn't start off abusive. It started off with him loving me and charming me and buying me gifts and, and loving my child, my firstborn. But Lakeisha stayed, unable to tell the difference between abuse and love. It became love in a way. If he's hitting me, he has to love me. What is it? Is he jealous? Oh, gosh, maybe I did do something to make him feel that way, and he just doesn't want to lose me. The relationship finally ended, but Lakeisha would continue jumping in and out of abusive relationships another 10 years, having three more children along the way. My self-esteem is so low. My confidence is shot. I remember looking in the mirror, what is wrong with you? One day after another brutal beating, Lakeisha took her children to a home daycare run by Pam Fisher. And then when she took the glasses off, there was bruises. At that time, at that time, I'm sorry, that's when you know that she needs the love of Christ more than ever because she had a hard night that night before. She would say, you know Jesus loves you? Do you know God cares for you? Do you know you're special? Do you know you're beautiful? But the words didn't start sinking in until Lakeisha's abuser followed her to Pam's home. He comes in, she gets right in the middle of us because she sees fire is breathing from this man. And I told him, no, you're not doing this here. You have to go. I'm thinking, no, he's about to kill this woman, and then he's going to kill me. I saw his fist clench up. She planted her feet, and she said, you leave my house now. 
And he stood there for a moment, but then he backed up and then he went out the door. I think at that moment, I was like, wow, what kind of power did this woman just have? So I'm like, God, it has to be you. I started believing that I was worthy, that I was special, that someone would love me. Lakeisha left her boyfriend and tried to forge a new life, but she still couldn't break the cycle and again ended up with an abusive man. He took it to another level when he put a gun to her head and threatened to kill her and himself. I really think God had put his arms around me at that time. I said to him, God, I need you to help me. I, I need you to help me because I'm scared. A knock on the door. It was our landlord. And he said, I need you guys out. We think that there is a gas line somewhere leaking. Finally, Lakeisha had the courage to take her children and leave. I remember that night thanking God, you saved me. As much as I've been unfaithful to you, and you're still standing there with your arms wide open. In the coming days and weeks, Lakeisha began to understand what Pam had been saying about God's love for her. You love me, me, all this ugly stuff in me with these men and that men and fornicating and children out of wedlock. You still love me and I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that he still was there for me. And I remember telling him, God, just use me, forgive me, forgive the sins that I've committed, God, save me. Lakeisha started living her life for Christ and now see someone very different in the mirror. I see God through me today. I see his image in me today. Along with her husband, Antonio, Lakeisha is raising her five children. She also helps victims of abuse through a nonprofit called Free. Like Pam, she tells them in God's eyes, they're special and worthy of his love. And I'm telling you, it is so much love to someone who thought she didn't deserve anything. To someone who thought that I won't be anybody. I'm not gonna be anything. He did all of that for me. You know, there's a song, pop song, I think it's Dean Martin used to sing, uh, you're nobody till somebody loves you, so find yourself somebody to love. There's something about the human being that wants love. We, we earnestly need love. We need companionship. We're not supposed to live our lives by ourselves forever. We, we need to be in families. We need to have love. And little children particularly need love from the time they're born. They need to be cuddled and they need to be kissed and they need to be hugged and they need to be loved. And they need to think there's something special and they need to have the relationship, the feeling that they're part of a family. That's what we need. And little Children feel that way. As a matter of fact, even the little primates feel that way. They want a mother. They want somebody to hug them, love them. And Letitia, for example, didn't have it. But there's so many children today who are born to abusive parents. They're born to children, uh, to parents who don't want them. Uh, they're born in situations with the mother and the father are fighting and, and they don't have any love. And consequently, especially the, the girls, will throw themselves at something in order to get love. And the something, usually the guys are out there, um, I hate to malign the young man, but they're out for sex. And they find some vulnerable girl, and she thinks that sex means that they love her, and it doesn't mean any such things. It means that they're trying to use her, and they fall for it. And so Letitia was one who kept looking for somebody to love her. And she kept giving herself to these men because she thought their attention meant that they loved her. And she was hideously, horribly wrong. And, but what did she do? She kept bringing children into the world. Now, folks, let me tell you, there's one who loves you un, without any reservation, and that is your heavenly Father. The one who created you loves you without reservation. He overlooks your flaws. He knows exactly who you are and what you've done, but he loves you in spite of it. He loves you, 
And God Almighty loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. And God loves you. And what he's saying to you today is reach out to that love. Let him love you. Accept his love and recognize that he's not trying to use you or take advantage of you. He's, it is un, uh, well, it's love without any uh, strings attached. Now, I have something I want to give you. It's called A New Day. And it tells you about how much the Lord loves you and what he's done for you and what it means to be born again. And if you want to have this, I want you to go to your phones and call in and say, look, I, I want to know the Lord. And one of these counselors will tell you what it is you've got to do to, to, to find him. And we'll send you this packet that will help you along the way. But please know right at this minute that God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, loves you. And he loves you so much that he let his son die that you might be part of his family in heaven. He really does love you. Terry? Well, coming up, how a strange dream changed a city and then became the subject of a major motion picture. We'll take you inside the new movie, Same Kind of Different as Me, when we come back. Well, it's an unlikely friendship. A wealthy international art dealer reaches out to a homeless man, hoping to save his struggling marriage. That real life story became a best-selling book, and now it's a major motion picture. It's called The Same Kind of Different as Me, and it hits theaters today. Our Ephraim Graham sat down with the Academy Award-winning cast. Take a look. I had another dream last night. Was it a good one, or was it about me? It was about a poor wise man who changes the city. Debbie Hall's dream gave birth to the best-selling book, The Same Kind of Different as Me. It also began the friendship between the two men who wrote it, her husband Ron, a wealthy art dealer, and Denver Moore, a homeless man. They met at a Texas shelter. My wife showed me Christ-like forgiveness a few years before that for having an affair, and mm -hmm. she threw my sin as far as the East is from the West, never to bring it up again. Just like Christ forgives our sins, mm -hmm. she erased it out off the blackboard of her life and memory. and. Uh, and so I told her for that forgiveness, I would do anything she asked the rest of our lives together. Yeah. And she had asked me to do nothing except be faithful and back in the church and mm -hmm. serve and tithe and all the kind of things that we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and, as believers. I was always waiting for the shoe to fall. And then one day she asked me to be friends with a crazy homeless man who threatened to kill everybody. <laughs> That's a big ask. <laughs> what about him? He can be dangerous. Hi. What's your name? You don't need to know my name. Well, I'd like to know your name. We have to talk to him. I don't understand what's going on here. That's a man from my dream. You'd be doing me a big favor and just being nicer. You want to be my friend? Uh-huh. Well, I'm going to have to think about that. It's a miracle story and a major motion picture with an Academy Award winning cast. Renee, you play Debbie. Yes. Um, what is it about her that allowed her to forgive her husband, first yeah. of all, mm -hmm. and then send him chasing after a homeless man? What Boy. about her? Mm. That's the question I would love to have been able to ask her myself. Mm. And uh, in reading the book and in talking to her husband, Ron Hall, um, what I gather is she was a good person, just mm -hmm. inherently good, and she had faith, and she wanted to commit her life to making a difference in other people's mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And boy, did she. Yeah. I imagine that touched you personally. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does make you ask yourself, okay, what am I doing? <laughs> I couldn't understand why I never could see where he went. I think God was giving me a lesson about me. He's Debbie. Jamie, you play Denver. Yeah. Do you think he's the hero in this story? I think Debbie's the hero. Debbie brings us, you know, together. Debbie uh, brings the human um, 
touch out of us. I mean, for Ron, you know, obviously. What touched you most about Denver's character? You know, when you look at uh, where he came from, mm -hmm. what, um, you know, uh, the challenges, uh, you know, in life, uh, you know, sort of like uh, he, he was faced with life. Uh, and despite all that, the, uh, the, 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 the wisdom that comes through um, his uh, outlook on life, unconditional love that he has for humanity, you know, mm -hmm. that comes out literally after, you know, sort of like Ron Hall sort of breaks the ice, you know, I mean, breaks the, uh, you know, that, that connection. It's beautiful to see, and it's a very, uh, he's a, quite a, um, a tough character to, uh, to, to portray. God put every stars in the heaven and even gave every one of them a name. If one was gone far from the sky, that was up to him too. Denver's wisdom comes from many real-life challenges. Most are unimaginable. The short version is he was crazy. Mm -hmm. He was an ex-con. Mm -hmm. He had been on the streets for 25 years. Wow. He did not read or write. He had never been to school a day in his life. And the most tragic thing, when he was a, just a young, innocent 16-year-old boy back on a plantation in Louisiana, uh, one day he was helping a white woman change a flat tire when all of a sudden three Klansmen come out of the woods on horseback and, and accused him of bothering a white lady. They put a noose around his neck and dragged him behind a horse and told him never again speak to a white person and never again uh, uh, look a white woman in the eye. He was 62 years old on the day that I first laid eyes on him. Wow. And he had kept that promise from the time he was 16. Wow. And here you have this white woman essentially and you have this coming. white woman getting in his face <laughs> and forcing him to look her in the eye. What you reading? It's a book of stories, poetry. I used to read to you when you were little. You never liked it much. Greg, you play Ron. I see he makes a cameo in the film. I've had a chance to meet and talk to him, so I know you have as well. What was it about him uh, that you gleaned that you wanted to make sure you brought to this, this role? Uh, I, I think just how much um, uh, Debbie, his wife, and, and Denver, how much uh, he learned from them, how much he, he they changed him. This is a guy who was very insulated and kind of guy who's looking to seek forgiveness through writing a check for his wife's cause. All those kind of go-to touchstones of the human kind of selfish behavior. He's the first to say he's a flawed person, but I, I can tell through this movie how deeply affected he was, not only by her, but his relationship with Denver and, and that passion for trying to, you know, for needing to get that story out. A word that was so different from all the people, but what I found out was everybody's different. Same gone different as me. Ephraim Grant, CBN News, Los Angeles. The movie Same Kind of Different as Me opens nationwide today. Check your local listings for times and theaters, or you can log on to cbnnews.com. And I uh, want you to consider going. I've heard it's wonderful. Well, still ahead, he's the YouTube sensation behind the hit Why I Love Jesus But Hate Religion. Now he'll tell us about a real love that lasts. Jefferson and Elizabeth, he join us live, and that's next on today's show. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A Syrian force backed by the U.S. has declared victory over ISIS in the, Rock, in the city of Raqqa in Syria. That is the city that ISIS called its capital. The Kurdish-led forces say there are no ISIS fighters left in the city. A senior Kurdish commander said, our victory is won against terrorism. The fall of Raqqa marks a major defeat for ISIS, which has seen its territory shrink steadily since last year. Iraqi government forces and Shiite militias are fighting Kurdish force, forces in the strategic and oil-rich province of Kirkuk, and the Iraqi forces are fighting with U.S. weapons. Middle East experts see the clear influence of Iran behind the aggressive campaign against the Kurdish regional government. Some are concerned if the joint Iraqi and Shiite forces are not stopped, they will advance towards Erbil, the capital of Kurdistan. The Kurdish government is looking to the United States for help. 
President Trump made a speech about countering Iranian aggression in the region, and one Middle East expert tells CBN News Iranian aggression is taking place right now on the plains of northern Iraq. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. We'll be back with much more of The 700 Club coming up right after this. Jeff and Alyssa Bethke came from two very different backgrounds. But as they reached adulthood, they both started to wonder if they'd been duped about love, dating, and sex. And now, after learning some tough lessons, they're telling others about how they found a better way forward. Take a look. Jeff and Alyssa Bethke have been happily married for five years. But before they met, Jeff had a distorted view of relationships, and Alyssa had never held a guy's hand. We're infected with this disease of fake love, of a bad view of love, of lies we believe about sexuality and marriage, and it's killing us. In their new book, Love That Lasts, Jeff and Alyssa offer lessons from their own personal successes and failures and present a realistic option for love, dating, and marriage. And they're here to talk about it. Jeff and Alyssa Bethke are with us, and we welcome you to the program. Thanks for having us. Jeff, you just said that we've been infected with this mm -hmm. disease of a bad view of yeah. love. What's our bad view? Um, I, think, I think primarily we've turned love into something selfish, something about taking and something mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what can I get out of it? Rather than if you look at Jesus, who mm -hmm. shows us what love is like, it's for him all about giving and sacrifice. And I tell this funny story in the first chapter of, um, it's kind of like this, uh, I, was, I, I had to tell this funny story of my first flat tire I ever got. <laughs> now when I got it, it just kind of felt like almost like my emergency brake was on. It just kind of, I was dragging, but I didn't think it was a flat tire because the movies made it sound like, you know, you're going to spin out. There's going to be an explosion. <laughs> there's going to be fire. Um, and so I just kind of kept going and it actually ruined my car over yeah. time, you know, because when you drive on a flat tire, it really Pull hurts. Over the, to the side. Exactly. It really hurts the car. And so I use that as a funny analogy to kind of talk about that's a lot of us with our distortions of love, sex, mm -hmm. marriage, and dating right now is because our lives aren't just exploding in the minute we make a bad decision, it just kind of feels like maybe we're dragging. Yeah. Um, we don't realize that God actually has something more for us and we weren't meant to drive on that flat tire. Well, and sometimes I think the world presents such a skewed picture of the perfection God intended, you wound up being influenced by porn at an early totally. age when you were very young, yeah. and that impacts you for years to come. Yes, and that's what we talk about too. We're kind of in this um, almost social experiment right now with the digital age of, you know, our generation was one of the first generations that grew up native to the internet, meaning like we don't know a time before it, right? right. I've heard about fax machines, but I've never seen one, um, <laughs> right? And so we talk about that of how that's actually having deep ramifications yeah. of this ubiquitous yeah. nature of yeah. information and internet, and it sometimes is uh, kind of yeah. hurting us. That no one's really understood the total impact of until just recently, totally. really. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, you on the other hand, grew up in church and were part oh, of the True Love Waits movement, and, and that impacted you as well. Yeah, it did. I think I s had seen what the culture was doing and I knew I didn't want to do that and I wanted to do what God wanted the best for me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think I made a lot of decisions then out of fear because I was so fearful of losing my virginity yeah. or whatever it may be that I just got so fearful where I couldn't even like talk yeah. to a guy unless if I was like, oh, do you think I love them? <laughs> yeah. and just like, it was just, there were some things that weren't healthy there either. Well, mm -hmm. there's some, there are often these perfectionistic things yes. that fall upon us mm -hmm. that give us that kind of fear. And mm -hmm. with that, you kind of fell into an addiction of your own for a season of time anyway with food. Right, mm -hmm. right. I had an eating disorder for about six years and it started with, I would say, just I so longed to have a boyfriend and to have someone pursue me and I mm -hmm. saw my friends dating and no one was coming after me. And then I would look around and be like, oh, everyone that is dating, they look this way. So I need to be a certain mm -hmm. size. And so it just started and it eventually became more of a control issue when something wasn't going on in my life that I could control. I turned to that, but it was hard. So talk a little bit, if you will, about the first years of your marriage, because <laughs> the two of you wouldn't have looked like a likely couple totally, to bring yeah. together, yeah. can yeah. I just say. Yeah. So here you are, you've mm -hmm. been exposed to the, some bad Dark perceptions things, yeah, hard of things, love. Yeah. You have been trying to be perfect to find love, and the yeah. two of you come together, and what happens? Yeah, I think we realized, and that's what we talk about in the book, is that we almost kind of advocate for this like third better way, we call it. And what I mean is kind of like, I was more the prodigal son story, 
and she was kind of more in the more religious Pharisee side of things, being pressured and coerced by uh, fear and pressure. Sure. Um, but but you, you realize that, hey, those rules aren't bad. Those rules, you know, the, the things you see in scripture are actually God's vision for sexuality and marriage and love. But what we had to come to learn is that those for our blessing, those are mm -hmm. for our flourishing, not just so that we might do them so we don't go to hell or something yeah. like that. And that was the big difference is I, I, you know, I always talk about this phrase in the Old Testament where God always talks to Israel and says, you know, obey this command. And then the next sentence is, so that it may go well for you. Yes. And that's the like, yeah. that's why we Get should live picture. in God's, yeah. yeah, that's why we should live in God's way is so that it may go well for us. So since we're talking about marriage, let's talk about another pressure that sometimes hits people unexpectedly. You're married for a while, mm -hmm. you have two children now, yes. and kids change things. <laughs> yes. Talk Just about how that's happened, You Alyssa. go to bed way earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually got pregnant 10 months in, so that yes. was a huge surprise. Great. But I would honestly say being having kids earlier, because we were on the three to five year plan, was actually so good for us. Because I feel like even when you're married, if you don't have kids, you can still be pretty independent, like yes. still kind of do your own thing. You're still like sanctifying each other, but it's still yeah. pretty. But then when you have kids, it's like, wow, all of a sudden it's like. <laughs> Trial by fire. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of like. How, <laughs> but they're a blessing. <laughs> like truly serving the other so you can be a team. Totally. Or so, else, yeah, it goes hard. So the title of your book is Love That Lasts. Mm -hmm. How do we get that? <laughs> and we Good made a, question. Yes, we, we, and we kind of even made a joke in the book, I think, where I, I wish our, I almost tried to convince our publisher to make it love that last question mark. Because yeah. I mean, we don't know, you know, like we're, we need to also you're, admit that. You're on the journey. Exactly. But I think what we talk about in the book is, um, but we already, we've already seen like what I mentioned that it may go well for us of like, you know, us versus some of our friends. We already have some friends who are, you know, porn is killing their marriage. They've already, yeah. you know, already have a friend who's been divorced after two years of marriage. And we're starting to say, hey, we want to chase God's way. We want to follow Jesus in these things. Mm -hmm. And for us, we're starting to see this trajectory difference between us and some of our peers. And I think that just shows that when you live in God's way, you get that return on the blessing of like, oh, this is actually how I'm created to live and how we should be um, following in these things. Well, there is a plan. And that's what this book is all about. Mm -hmm. It's the Bethke's book, but the plan is God's. Yes, <laughs> the, the title is called Love That Lasts. It's available wherever books are sold. It's a great read and it'll give you some wonderful concepts of how you can make your love last. Plus, we have a social exclusive interview with Jeff and Alyssa. Watch that by going to facebook.com slash 700 club. Here is the word of God. We want to leave you with that on this Friday. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God bless you. We'll see you next week.